All right. All right, let's get started. Hello, everyone. Um, hello. hello, hello, everyone. Thank you so Hi. much for joining us today um, for the Emerging Art Leader Symposium keynote address. Uh, my name is Jimena Varela. I am the program director of arts, the Arts Management Program at American University. And I have the enormous privilege of knowing these um, young leaders who have organized this event and had organized an entire conference of knowing them and working with them and just being um, so inspired by the way they have turned what could be a, a real calamity of an entire year's work um, of securing speakers, coming up with the program. The graduate students do this all by themselves with no input from, from the rest of the, the faculty. Uh, doing contracts, coming up with keynotes, uh, coming up with uh, the program, everything, and have it seen vanish because of, of a calamity that it was um, completely outside of their control. And if I admired them and I was hopeful about the lead future arts leadership of our, our, the country before this event, I am actually very reassured by the future leadership of um, the arts um, moving forward, given how they have responded to this and immediately, despite their own personal fears or personal anxieties, pivoted to turn this into an event that would bring our communities closer, that would um, give people things to think about and, and, and things to uh, reflect on and work on while we move forward and we move through this awful moment. And I also uh, want to give a shout out and a thanks to our keynote speaker, to Dimitri Joseph for um, being here to um, just work with us, uh, work with the students as these things evolved and make, um, put together a really truly beautiful program for you today. Um, I wanted to share a thought um, before I move on and introduce you to um, the EELS folks that um, about something that occurred last night and that I think speaks very much to the moment that we're all living through. Um, last night, one of my country's most beloved and respected teachers and scholars, uh, Rodolfo Gonzalez Risotto, who was also a friend, became the first fatality of the COVID virus in my home country of Uruguay. And just a few days before he passed away, in the final act um, of his life, when he already knew that things were looking grim, he sent flowers to the presidency of Uruguay. Mm. And those flowers came with a note. And the note said, with these beautiful flowers, I want to transmit a message of hope, reminding you that humanity has been able to overcome grave pandemics in the past. Let us be fearful only of fear, of fear itself, I gave you a big hug, Rodolfo. And um, we lost him last night, but I think the spirit that he demonstrated that um, really is a spirit that animates us all through this. As we come together, as we move forward, we are going to lose friends. We are going to lose people that we love. Um, but as this ends, and it will end one day, the arts are gonna be more necessary than ever. And if the arts are more necessary than ever, arts managers are going to be necessary, more necessary. There are arts leaders who can uh, survive this, come out on the other side and think of ways to bring community together and to heal our communities are going to be more necessary than ever. So I'm very happy to see you all here. Welcome to this event. Thank you so very much to the Emerging Leaders Symposium uh, team for staying together, making this event happen and bringing us all uh, together. I am going to turn this over now um, to um, Tara Schultz and Anya Simmons, um, who um, will be speaking and welcoming you on behalf of EELS and will be introducing our guest speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jimena. Um, the arts management faculty at AU, Jimena Varela, Andrew Taylor, and Sherburn Lachlan, have been an amazing support system for EELS through all of this. We're very lucky to have their guidance and the direction of our executive director, Anya Simmons, who led the organization this year and whose grace and dedication have been unshakable these past few weeks. Um, this year has brought unprecedented changes for us. We're all a little disoriented, but we can't think of a better time to be having this discussion. We'd like to thank Americans for the Arts for their support. Because of them, we're able to host this online programming free of charge. A few logistics notes before we get started. 
There will be points where we unmute your microphones, but we ask that for the remainder of the time, you keep your microphones muted to minimize disruption. And if you have questions during the address, please post them into the group chat. We'll compile them throughout the speech and they will be included in the Q&A afterwards. Now I'd like to introduce Mark Bamuti Joseph, accomplished artist, author, and speaker and Vice President and Artistic Director of Social Impact at the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. Bamuti is a 2017 TED Global Fellow, inaugural recipient of the Guggenheim Social Practice Initiative, and an honoree of the United States Artist Rockefeller Fellowship. He is in high demand for his creative approach to organizational design, brand development, and community mediation, and has been enlisted as a strategic partner or consultant for companies ranging from Coca-Cola to Carnegie Hall. We are so grateful to have him with us today, and I know we're all in our living rooms with our microphones muted, but let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Hi, one, two, one, two, one, two. Hey, uh, put up your uh, peace signs if you uh, hear me. Everybody's good. Okay, great. I appreciate it. Um, I know many of you have been on these uh, Zoom meetings or something like them all week. I appreciate that you're taking a little bit of time on a Sunday to um, uh, engage one another, to engage the collective. Um, I want to shout out my mom. Hi, I see you, mommy. Uh, I want to uh, say hi to the entire Emerging Arts Leaders Symposium uh, staff. Thank you for uh, one, bring me into your family in this way, and two, for persevering. I, I echo Jimena's uh, thoughts uh, and feel really honored to be able to speak to you guys today. Um, I also just um, want to offer everyone um, sentiments of peace and love and resolve and health, um, particularly those of you who um, work in healthcare or have healthcare workers um, in your um, family. Um, so um, I, what do I want to do? I want to share my screen with y'all. So intimate. <laughs> Let's see how to make this happen. Um, cool. So the first thing that um, I want to do, if it's okay, Tara, is to um, put, is to take everybody off of mute for a second. Um, I'd like to fill this particular room with um, intentional sound. So what I mean by that is, if all of you all could just speak the name of your favorite teacher, Right now, all at once. If you could now just um, speak the name of someone you love and a song you think of when you think of them. Speak the name of someone you love and a song you think of when you think of them. Um, you are my sunshine. Hey, nature boy. So easy. Sisters from the Kind of my life. Kind of my life. Kind of my life. Very right, Mikey. Mother. <laughs> Beautiful. Was someone trying to sing one of their songs? <laughs> I heard you. So, thank you. Um, I, I would like to shout out Dr. Melvin Raming. I'd like to shout out Dr. Daniel Omotoshka Black. I want to shout out my sister, Joelle. And um, the song I think of when I think of her is A Party Ain't a Party by Queen Penn. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh. So, um, this is how it's going to work. We can put it, we can put ourselves on mute again. Um, this is how it's going to work. Um,
section. The first section, I'm just going to call it as I see it. Um, the second section is going to be some nerd shit for those of you that are like really into systems, organizational design type stuff. Um, going to talk a little brass tacks. Um, we're going to dream a little. Uh, so that's what we'll do over the course of the next 20, 25 minutes. Um, as Tara said, if you have questions, just put them in the chat box and then we'll talk through them for another 10, 15 minutes together. Okay. Yes. Cool. Um, so um, BC used to be uh, before Christ. BC is now before the coronavirus fucked everything up. So once upon a time, it was three and a half weeks ago and pretty much everything was cool. We weren't paying artists enough, but there were gigs to be had. Um, and many of our staffs weren't diverse enough, but they were, um, uh, it was okay. We were solvent. Um, and a lot of us were struggling to create systems that invited community equity into our arts institutions. Um, those attempts didn't always get it done, but the question underneath those attempts, the one that prompted those attempts at equity, the question of who, of which communities do we feel accountable to that we want to create um, a sense of reciprocity with, those were the questions worth asking. Um, so it's a few weeks later, and now life is an Octavia Butler novel. Um, life is like an Octavia Butler novel swallowed George Orwell and the aliens haven't landed to save us yet. I'm doing a keynote address from my son's bedroom and I may or may not be wearing flannel pajama bottoms and house shoes. You'll never know because life today is not sitting together full bodied. It is being alone together in the same anxious moment, social but distant, a physically fractured, collectively traumatized body politic linked by a sense of dis ease but this is the emerging arts leader symposium so for most of the folks gathered here we are also linked by a certain call to lead um one time i was on this airplane flying to new york and i was listening to an album that a smart friend of mine um recommended music wasn't that great but she's smarter than me so i figured the music would get good eventually it was raining and we're about to land and suddenly the plane pulls up and it's clear that we're all gonna die all right die right now and i'm listening to this uh marcia ambrosius album which for me like wasn't super tight for me but we can debate that later right now i have no time I gotta find the music that I'm gonna transition to. I cannot die before I find the right song to die to. And I'm both frantically looking for the right song and also in my head, I'm thinking of my kid and trying to say goodbye. Music. Imagine Imagine the last week without music of any kind. Oh, wow. We got some people making trouble, Mabamuti, sorry. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's a Zoom bombing. Hold That's on. awesome. still with you okay wow
Well, we are working on removing the people who are not supposed to be here. Uh, it's all gravy. I appreciate it. We must be doing something right because the haters showed up. So thank you, haters. Love you. Love y'all. Um, so I'm going to go without, uh, without these slides. Um, and hopefully um, this thing will still be cogent. Um, hate will always be there. Um, I, I want us to imagine something else. I want us to imagine the last week without music. Imagine if in the last three and a half weeks, there were no books of poetry or prose to read. If you couldn't listen to music, you couldn't listen to music spun by D nice with Michelle Obama across the dance floor. You couldn't watch movies on Netflix. You couldn't watch series on Hulu. You couldn't take a dance class on your iPad. You couldn't do any of those things. Um, Imagine if all of a sudden the Indigo Girls and John Legend and Erica Badu just weren't playing concerts for you from their living room. That you had to engage your mind with something besides the crashing Dow and the rising curve. Art is literally saving the mental health of the country right now. Cultural health is a stabilizing force while socially distant. In this moment of isolation, we're connected by dread and the art that lifts us into shared joy. Life in America right now is being steered by nature, the news, and art at an unprecedented time, an unprecedented global inflection point. And all the meetings I'm in, people are saying that things may not ever be the same, which is true, but also things might not ever be the same. So who brokers the future? Um, the question that I've been asking for the better part of the last 15 years is, is it possible to choreograph social justice? Which is to say that um, people clearly organize around um, hate, destruction, and separation. Um, when it came to um, designing systems of deportation, designing systems of incarceration, um, the, the federal government seemed to know exactly what it was doing. So um, if you can design incarceration, if you can design systems that um, extricate people from their families, can you also design freedom? Um, three and a half weeks ago, most of us were working towards bringing people together. And that was hard enough. But the cultural stakes have clearly been raised. There are people that I know that I'll want to hug uh, close when this is over. There are people that I want to exhale with. They're gestures that we'll all need to mark that we've come through together soundly. Um, sports is going to play a significant role in our repatriation, but I'd like to suggest that when the coast is clear, arts experience will find um, a new power in brokering our new psycho-civic reality as serving as an intermediary of building a culture of building a culture of humane connection. All the stuff that we already do, but as arts leaders, um, there's an opportunity to design our country's collective re-entry through creativity, curation, community-centered projects, and convening. We can foster the business of art on a shifted set of collective priorities. I was speaking to a friend um, yesterday and um, 
you know, what's become very clear is that art is a democratizing phenomenon. Um, pandemics are also democratizing phenomenons. None of this will, none of us will emerge fully whole. All of us will be fractured. So compassion will be an infrastructural necessity. And if we do our jobs right, um, clearly and boldly, arts leaders will be intentional in our community redesign. So um, as it so happens for the last 15 years or so, I've dabbled a bit in intentional community design. I've looked up to folks like Rick Lowe and Theaster Gates, learned a lot from uh, Shanaka Hodge and Hadari Davis, Michael Garces of Cornerstone Theater, um, my uh, kind of ideological patron saint, this man, Paulo Freire, uh, from Tanya Brugetta, from Amar Tabor Smith, from my good friend, Brett Cook, Dred Scott, all of them taking very seriously the question of social empowerment and shared stakes. Um, shared stakes within creative communities and communities of intention. Um, all of them having a vision of gathering with art at the center in which witnessing art wasn't the goal. The goal was the aspiration of shared values. Um, convening with a certain kind of belief in the public imagination. Um, all of them with a community design, with art at the center, um, but that only works if people have more than a relationship to the art on stage. They have to have a relationship with each other. Um, all of them developing convening strategies based on sustained relationships to place and the subtext of civic intervention. So I've had an art practice of proscenium performance. Um, and also art-centered organizing in community settings, and also highfalutin arts jobs at highfalutin art centers. So um, where someone like Rick Lowe um, artistically organizes community in a fixed geography in Third Ward, Houston, for the last 10 years or so, um, my gig has been curating community within the context of institutional space. Um, and setting conditions for that community to alter the trajectory of the institution itself. So to talk just a little bit about um, organizing, to talk about systems. Um, the prototype for this work was the Life is Living Festival. Folks like Shanaka Hodge, Jason Mateo, Hadari Davis, Brett Cook, Rolando Brown, the entire Youth Speaks fam, Joe Nosado, those kinds of folks were there at the beginning. Um, I was living specifically um, where I entered the Life is Living story. I was living um, with this cat named Hadari Davis. This was 2008. We were thinking a lot about environment and doing a lot of work at national and international gatherings um, with leaders in the green movement. Um, these gatherings were highly segregated. So um, we started thinking about how to better engage black and brown communities in thinking about environment to, um, to reframe um, the, the kind of the literal picture and landscape of who was active um, in the green movement. Um, so we threw these events, the events were wildly successful, but um, you know, this was kind of like in a moment of creative place making and pre creative um, place keeping. The events were really successful, but as we did this work, um, it became clear that having the events as the primary thing that we were creating um, wasn't satisfactory. That if we actually wanted to have um, an impact, um, we couldn't assume that we knew um, what was best for the communities that we were entering, not just in Oakland where we live, but in Houston, in Chicago, in New York, and, um, and around the world. And so um, it became incumbent upon us to have a pedagogy of organizing that centered cultural leaders that we were working with, um, that we could use our institutional leverage to make connections between grassroots leaders. Um, 
but what was important in using that institutional leverage was language that really brought people together. And so um, we came up with this, this concept, really descended from Paulo Freire, um, that we call the creative ecosystem that was really about um, I, curating leaders from across local communities, um, asking the same question of those leaders and then giving them public space or using institutional leverage to support um, the, their activation of public space in response to a common question. So the, the primary in the, in, the prototype, in the prototype of um, how I was learning about community design was don't assume that you know what's best for any given community that you're going to enter, which um, seems uh, you know, seems perfectly logical, but um, I think many of us enter community, and I certainly did with a certain level of hubris. And so, um, you know, the one of the the core principles that followed in our design thinking was to um, embody a kind of humility as we move forward. Um, so around 2011, 2012, I started working at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts and carried that um, way of thinking about community organizing um, with me, um, worked with a, a great number of folks in building um, think tanks that also were responding to questions. Um, people like Kyla Searle and Christina Knight, Amy Vasquez, Julie Potter, uh, my homegirl Marcella, our CEO, Deborah Cullinan, all these folks um, worked in support of this work. Um, the primary thing that we did uh, in your, at your Buena in terms of evolving this model of thinking was to take artistic inquiry, which is to say um, we asked artists what question they were asking of themselves when they started developing the work that we would later present on our stages. And we would curate a group of 30 leaders and two years before we presented that work, we asked them the same question. So, um, these images come from a presentation that we did with young Jean Lee. She did this show called Untitled Feminist Show. Um, she said that as she was working on the show, she was asking herself what's on the other side of her body's joy and what's on the other side of her body's shame. And we asked 40 people those same questions a year before we presented the show and then um, had them create, essentially take over our campus um, as we presented the show, Untitled Feminist Show. So, so the core takeaway from this action was to use the intelligence in the room. Like, um, think about when you go to a performance and there are a couple of people that um, once the show is over, they don't leave because they're so inspired. Um, how do you take that energy? How do you channel that energy and transpose it in time so that... Um, so that you're, you're giving folks who have a penchant for inspiration, some utility and some device to use that same artistic um, inspiration and implement it in institutional space. Um, use the intelligence in the room. Um, I worked at Yerba Buena for about seven years and um, then moved to the Kennedy Center, which is um, a trippy place. Um, trippy in particular because I hadn't been, you know, I'd worked in the Bay Area all my adult life and being in a federal space um, meant that I had to rethink my relationship to America. Um, and um, one of the ways that I drew inspiration as I transitioned to the Kennedy Center was um, engaging um, a young man named Jamaria Hall, who was from Detroit, who, um, along with a number of other young people, sued the government of Michigan because um, attending one of the worst private schools in Detroit, they were saying that their constitutional right to literacy was being violated because their schools, um, Michigan hadn't created proper learning environments for their schools. Um, they filed a class action lawsuit and um, uh, adopted the 14th Amendment, the violation of the 14th Amendment, which um, 
was completely moving to me because essentially their argument was that they had a constitutional right to literacy. So as I transitioned to the Kennedy Center, um, I thought a lot about that idea about not just a constitutional right to literacy, but also a constitutional right to inspiration. That inspiration itself is a democratic ideal and that um, if we're going to have life and liberty for all, then we should have inspiration for all as well. So um, here's the thing. Um, most of our historic institutions aren't hardwired for equity, which is no shade because our country isn't really hardwired for equity either. Um, in the case of the Kennedy Center, for the last 50 years, it's functioned as a citadel of exclusive performance. Um, but when I was hired, as I was coming on, we were opening up our new space, which is called um, The Reach. And when we decided to expand, um, we weren't just building buildings, we created a more porous and accessible space. Um, we essentially thought we were building buildings, but we built a culture park. Um, the architecture and the mandate at this geography meant that um, what we were making was a public utility. And on top of that, when we opened up this utility, uh, we started with a 16-day festival that engaged more than 100,000 people, half of them who had never been to the Kennedy Center before. So um, what this new expansion wants to do, what the reach wants to be, is a lot of what the Kennedy Center hasn't been. So we have to design a culture and set of practices that privilege equity and do it as a gesture of joy and love, um, along with the solemnity of being the national center for culture. So um, in addition to the other lessons that I um, brought with me to the Kennedy Center around organizational design, um, the two principal um, things that, um, that I did um, along with my team, uh, Diana Ezrins and Ariel Davis and um, Kathy Fletcher and so many others, um, we created a layered, vetted, and visionary structure for measuring the efficiency of our community interfacing programs, which is to say that we did not measure our community-facing programs by how many people showed up. We measured them by our process. Um, is there a values proposition? Um, are we um, uh, amplifying community collaboration? Um, is peace, is place keeping happening? Is cultural wellness happening? Is incubation happening? Um, these three figures, this is Aretha Franklin in 1966. This is uh, Alvin Ailey in 1960. This is Stevie Wonder. Um, in 1970. Um, these photos were taken before most of these folks created the work that we know them best for. This is before Songs in the Key of Life. This is before Revelation. This is um, before Do Right Woman. Um, incubation, this idea that we can take um, creative geniuses at the precipice of iconic status and make space that we can incubate new ideas um, using our institutional leverage, that is a primary metric for how we get down. Um, and the embodiment of our incubation at the Kennedy Center is the Culture Caucus, um, which is an assembly of DC individuals, organizations, and initiatives that we honor, financially support, and hold space for in our programming at the REACH. Um, the Culture Caucus is our means of curating community. It reflects our evolving belief that we can be a leader of social practice um, and creative community empowerment, as well as the nation's beacon for the performing arts. Um, this is a two-year incubator program for 20 or more DC-based programs. So um, what I'm saying in totality is that I've been an institution-aligned artist for the last 10 years. And my basic job description hasn't been to generate audience. It's been to generate culture. Um, and if I were to distill my principal learnings in that time, they would be um, don't assume you know shit, um, fully utilize the intelligence in the room, measure yourself by the quality of your processes, and invest in community. 
financially invest in community so as to generate true equity. So bearing these learnings in mind and given these times, the question for us is what are you as an arts leader gonna do in preparation for our return? Um, what are we currently learning about the human spirit, the organizing muscle and volunteerism? How many TikToks have you seen this past week with the entire family dancing and acting together? What do we do with that energy? How do we utilize the intelligence in the room? And by the room, I mean the country. As arts leaders, how do we plan to meet the emotional profile of a planet suffering from PTSD? If not in the cultural sector, who sets the moral and aesthetic and equitable pathway to rebuild our communities? Can we steward the cultural health of our country and transition it? with a true vision of cultural equity, beginning with the art we make and encompassing the currency of compassion. So um, I have to acknowledge that I'm talking about what we're gonna plant in the ashes when most of us are actually still on the pyre burning. The entire ecosystem of art centers, producers, designers, ushers, stagehands, agents, performers, I've had gigs canceled. I've had to let people go on my own staff. I've watched the money that I saved to send my kid to college vaporize in his 529 account. He's supposed to go to school in the fall. I've invoked force majeure. I've had a show that was gonna premiere with Destiny Arts Center set to premiere in Oakland, um, had to cancel that. Um, so, I personally am impacted by our industry's volatility and insecurity. The lost income is staggering. And so is the question of where the new income will emerge and why people should come back to the theater and the gallery and why philanthropy should triple its investment in the arts upon our collective return. So I challenge all arts leaders to do an expanded kind of scenario planning. Um, most of the time when we do scenario planning, we're thinking about the viability of our business, but I would urge us to do a scenario planning that includes a vision of the relationship between the business model and the cultural ambition predicated on the reality that we will all need to heal the relationship between financial stability and cultural stability and inclusion, a vision of promoting cultural health after we've been newly connected in the matter of life or death. Our financial res resuscitation um, tied to our methodologies and our relationship to the social contract. And in order to do this, we have to deploy artists in our country, not just to make art, but to intentionally make culture use our art centers not just to show art, but to make community. The currency of arts organizations, the value of artists isn't some extra side hustle thing that America does. Right now, it is America itself. And that value should carry over into how we build the economy for whatever it is that's coming next. We can rebuild the structural economy and the moral economy at the same time by integrating artists more soundly into our systems thinking. We can boldly invite philanthropists and patrons and government to follow suit. Each of us has an opportunity to revisit the nature, not of art, but of artistic intelligence as it relates to currency, organizational modeling, and public space. We can use all of these as a field to reconvene based on aspirational values. So Emerging Arts Leader Symposium, you who have self-selected, um, you who, um, Imagine yourselves as cultural leaders. If we get this thing right, no, they won't ever be the same. I want you to consider the work it takes to live the dream at scale, to think of the dream as a kind of cultural currency. And to that extent, the consequences of not doing the work are too big to fail. Let's talk about equity, not equity like we're all here in the house, equity like what you've invested in your house, what you've invested in your children. What do we wish to reap 
from cultural equity? And how do we keep that stock high? We all dream of the beautiful democracy and truth is racial equity is the price. Truth is you might could buy more with the lie. Nikki Giovanni said, truth is, if now ain't a good time for truth, I don't see when we'll get to it. And so we as arts leaders wake up and we get to it. Hugh Masekela said, it is incumbent on all human beings to oppose injustice in every form. And that is the truth. The public is an idea, and that idea is in need of representation, symbols of our aspiration, avatars of our moral commitment to be better, avatars like kings, symbols like dreams, and brass tacks like labor and shared risk, the drawing of maps, the work of rebuilding the village, healing ourselves, seeing ourselves, justice, is not a surprise waiting for you behind curtain number two on The Price is Right. Justice itself comes at the steep price of committed energy and time and self-sacrifice to help assure somebody else's rights. There is a link between broken relationships and broken economies, a circle of unbroken trust. Is that not what we mean by cultural equity? That we're all different, but we're all us. On the day after, there will remain still a moral infrastructure to rebuild, a moral compass to hold steady, a mandate to knock down the walls of what Baldwin called the sunlit prison of the American dream. Following the transformative vision comes the transformative action, authentic vulnerability, course correction, cultural equity measured against an index of self-love, a self-love that doesn't involve the hatred of anyone else, a love of self based on what one can make, how one feels under the light of the sun, a self-love that doesn't involve the fear of a single solitary anyone, a self-love where everybody's safe. Freedom is not fate. History leaves scars. Healing is not preordained. The capital gains of community catharsis, the moral economy fueled by cultural equity, shared risk, shared company, the mountaintop view of dreaming together in public. And so what I'm calling for, family, is institutional rewiring. I call on us to design an equitable social future and then build the bridge to get there. The dominant paradigm for equity implies that we're letting the historically marginalized or underrepresented into the existing framework to achieve a better proportionality of voices. The zeitgeist currently is holding a paradigm of solidarity. It actually requires us to be in relationship. We are in a moment of shared risk, and out of that, we can grow a landscape of shared stakes that is modeled first by the arts sector and the communities that support it. We got to make a way or find one. Thank you guys for your patience, um, and I'm super down if there are no more Nazis in the crowd to take any questions. Thank you so much, Bamuti. That was really beautiful. Um, I just do want to take a moment to acknowledge um, what happened. Um, people saw an open and public forum and used it for hate. Um, I know you um, already spoke about it, but um, I just wanted to thank everyone for staying with us and just being here. Um, I think it's really important to have conversations like this. Um, we, I put um, something in the chat, um, just, I think we'll have people um, send their questions to our email, just um, to keep it a little, <laughs> a little cleaner. So if you can email Symposium at american.edu. Um, but if there's anybody um, from the EELS committee that wants to start off with a question, um, I think we'll start there. Or I can start. <laughs> um, a question I have for you is, um, what's something that's inspiring for you right now? What are things, you know, any suggestions for what we can be looking to for 
um, creativity, inspiration, and positivity. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what's always inspired me is, um, you know, I, I come from a people of overcome. And so my people inspire me, my family, my, um, my ancestors. Um, I'm doing a, a work right now with um, about 30 young people at Destiny Arts Center. Um, 30 young people, uh, about um, 15 elders over the um, age of 70. We're working with six families who've, um, who lost um, their sons and daughters before those sons and daughters turned 35. Um, in those families, um, there was, there's one family that lost someone who, um, was 14 years old. There's one family that lost someone, uh, that was 31 and then, um, uh, all in between. And essentially what we're talking about, what we're doing is thinking about, um, crisis and healing um, self-forgiveness and how it is that we organize around evolution. Um, and the, the young people who, you know, they're teenagers, so they're kind of a pain in the ass. And also they're so amazing. And so, um, the young people are extremely, um, inspiring to, inspiring to me and the way that, um, the community has rallied around them and around these families to, um, to engage that's inspiring too so uh, again I, I think i just urge that um as we think about where our next investments are in the cultural sector that we think about these um communities of practice that are meditative that speak directly to cultural malady and that are thinking about um intentional healing along with intentional community design Well, I have a question as well. Hey, Mabamuti, thank you so much for doing this. Um, I'm just curious when you talk about changing the way organizations think and act in the world, you've worked at a wide range of different scales of organization. And I'm curious, particularly because you're talking to a lot of current and future managers and cultural organizations, are there sort of attributes of the leaders that you find most able to navigate both sizes and make them change positive? Are there uh, how are what are the approaches you bring when you're when you're dealing with a different scale um like when you enter the kennedy center the year um talk a little bit about sort of the managers you see thriving and making change in those environments um you know um i believe in love and i believe in soulfulness and i think very often we don't, you know, both love and soul are these four letter words within the institution that we don't um, uh, integrate into our practices or, um, or ideologies. Um, I, I, th I think that it's important that we lead with love. And I know that that, you know, maybe I've been in California too long, but, um, you, you know, an institution is not, it's, is not defined by its walls. It's not defined by its hard edges. It's um, defined by um, its capacity to dissolve those walls, to create connection. And that's an emotional thing. It takes sacrifice. Um, you, you know, the when I was presenting just now and you know, random swastikas started appearing on the screen. That was harrowing and hurtful and shocking. And um, which, which is all to say that I felt something. And I think very often um, institutions and the folks that work within them um, you know, feel a little insecure about bringing their feelings to the table. And I think that it's important that we operate um, inside of authenticity, that we're able to be both clinical and emotional as we make decisions and also to operate from that space 
as we connect others to um, uh, to a broader purpose. So I guess um, love, soulfulness, authenticity, resilience, um, and then as a fifth characteristic, cultural aspiration. So if the goal is to put on a show, yeah, we can do that. And there's so many people that produce shows very well. But um, I would urge us to think beyond the scope of the proscenium box or um, the gallery to, um, to think about a social vision and to work in support of um, a social vision, not just a curatorial vision. Um, and hopefully one that is inclusive, expansive, and centered in love and joy. Thank you. That was an amazing answer. Um, we have our first email question, um, which is, how does social justice unfold in a time of social distancing? Social justice is unfolding right now because yes. of social distancing, you know? you really have to be an asshole. Like you really have to like try really hard to, um, to be disruptive in this moment. You have to be willfully ignorant and also um, willfully hateful. And again, like, you know, maybe I've been in California too long, but I fundamentally believe in um, that that human beings are love-centered individuals. Many of us have been hurt. Many of us have been traumatized. Um, we are, as I said, experiencing a collective trauma right now. This isn't regular. And there is an emotional cost to that. So, um, how you know, the, the question for us is, is how we utilize compassion um, as, um, as core material to build a bridge to a social future. That, um, also, you know, we clearly are not going to um, eradicate hate with a snap of a finger or a cute little dance or like, you know, a poem, you know, um, the, there is no wand, right? That's just going to, um, eviscerate uh, all of the animosity that exists in the world. So that's not the intention here. Um, but there is a th such a thing, I believe, as the adjacent possible, which is to say not, um, you can't snap your fingers and end white supremacy, but you, I think, can create conditions that, um, bring people closer together more compassionately that afford greater equity to, um, to more and more individuals. Um, and I don't see that coming out of political leadership, which is mostly transactional. I see that coming out of cultural leadership, which is figurative, emotional, aesthetic, and aspirational. That um, political leaders um, um, help us to um, live in terms of supply systems and healthcare and like this. But artistic leaders, um, cultural leaders help us to dream. And that in this moment by, might be the more core component in terms of how we get to a more socially just uh, society. Thank you. Um, another question that's kind of related. Um, is how can arts managers bring community-based mindsets into traditionally individual environments? Uh, I, I think it takes a, a network or a networked response. Um, you know, some of the things that I shared in terms of my personal experience, hopefully they continue to, um, to persevere and resonate just in terms of some um, some bottom line ideas. But the, the truth is, is that development um, marketers, um, curators, um, finance people, senior, uh, senior leadership officials, we all have to be on the same page. Um, it's scary, I think, for some to think about the viability of their businesses as attached to a social future, not just um, the immediate um, moment inside of their building. Um, let's say that um, 
that some of our resistance to weaning ourselves off of fossil fuels is, um, is a symptom of that anxiety. We know what's best for us and for the planet, but it, it doesn't always serve the current economic model. Um, so the bravery that has to be displayed in terms of um, in terms of vision and in terms of how we craft our economic models, that's really what's up. That's really um, what's up for, for inquiry, for investigation and for manifestation right now. Um, so I'm not saying reinvent your entire business model. I'm not, you know, I'm not lighting the transactional um, aflame. Um, but I am saying that a greater proportion of community interest um, has to be integrated into our business models, um, into the programs that we create. And maybe what that means, as I said, is a little less deployment of artists on stage and a little more deployment of artists as systems thinkers. Um, and that's what I would encourage managers to consider, that a season isn't just the shows that you put on stage. It's not just the shows that you put on the gallery. A season is um, the ecosystem of artistic deployment. And um, we can curate that as well as curating the shows in whatever black black box or opera house um, might be in our purview. Great. Um, and so, sorry, you were talking about kind of business model transitions. Um, one question we had was um, besides putting art back on our stages or as you've said, um, uh, do you believe that arts organizations will need to do more than just that to bring back audiences and rebuild trust in arts and culture again after these times? I think the most important part of that question is how do we, how do we rebuild our relationships with communities when our organizations have been, you know, not able to traditionally reach out? Um, first, by understanding that this is longitudinal and that it takes time. Um, you know, the, the thing, any, any good relationship has, um, a fair amount of question asking, of communication, of listening. Um, and particularly, you know, I've, I've worked at arts institutions that have, um, a disproportionate amount of power and I've worked at arts institutions well, I, I wouldn't call them arts institutions. It's like me and my homeboy, uh, you know, running around everywhere we can, <laughs> trying to, you know, try to get at these kids, trying to learn, trying to make poems. And uh, there's, in, in each case, you know, what I've learned is that you have to show up, that you have to be present. Um, that the work doesn't always happen um, at your crib where you want it to happen, meaning that that the work of community doesn't necessarily happen at your theater. It happens in community itself. So where is the geographical coordinate of your work? You know, is it at the Kennedy Center? Is it at Arena Stage? Is it at Yerba Buena Center? Is it at the Museum of Contemporary Art? Or, um, you know, is the goal the public imagination. So I think that that's how you develop trust, is that you develop your listening skills and you rethink where the site of your work is. And I, I, I feel like I keep having to um, reiterate, I am, I am not saying demolish your theater, um, forget all the seats and, um, become a community-based organization without walls. There are, are plenty of community-based organizations without walls. Um, how it is that we are in partnership, how it is that we are networked, how it is that we're dividing resources, those become um, the more salient questions. Great, thank you. Um, and another question, it appears to be that this crisis is giving creativity and humanity a boost, maybe not on Zoom, but um, if you agree, then how can we keep this momentum going? Do you think that listening and 
you know, community engagement is the is the answer to that. Well, look, man, there's just like a cultural, there's like a leadership void, you know, like there's, um, and so the, you know, the, the, the idea of this crisis as um, a democratizing phenomenon um, means that we have right now a kind of decentralized cultural leadership. If you think about, you know, all the culture that you're taking in, like, yes, there's entertainment, but um, there's something more than that. There's something about the intimacy of coming together and working, you know, in family to make art and to make culture. Like, we're just in a different space. So uh, arts organizations, I think, have to um, be intentional in latching onto that. In other words, we can't pretend that you know, these three weeks or these, you know, six weeks or these three months, when it's over, we can't pretend emotionally that it didn't happen. We can't just say, all right, well, we had a business model in December of 2019, and we're going to try to get back to that business and curatorial model as quickly as we can. Um, You know, this is why I'm saying now, in the midst of the thing, Let's envision the hereafter. You know, let's envision the hereafter and think about this synthesis of a cultural model and a business model. Um, And yeah, I guess what I'm asking for is for us to utilize the imagination that's so pervasive and amplified right now in the cultural discourse and to integrate it into our spaces in in a profound and intentional way. I keep using the word intention because the thing isn't just going to happen. Um, but we have to trust ourselves. If we're going to call ourselves leaders, then we have to act like it. Otherwise, like, why is you here? Yeah. Um, kind of a shift to a different question. Can you talk about cultural literacy and radical self-love? <sighs> yeah. Uh, cult- to me, cultural literacy, um, you know, I speak English kind of good, and then I speak a couple of other languages, okay? But um, I know where I am most literate. And, um, y- you know, part of cultural literacy, part of cultural legibility is to um, use your voice in the best way that you know how. Um, Another part of cultural literacy is um, demonstrating enough humility to know that others speak just as profoundly and just as expertly in their own cultural voices. Um, So some of cultural literacy is about a self-confidence and a self-love, and some of cultural literacy is about um, humility and um, an attenuated listening, which for many of us that grew up in hip hop culture, you you know, I have a friend, I call her um, uh, Rapopedia because she knows like every lyric to every song that's ever been made, you know? And, you know, there's a thing about listening to one another and we think about that across borders. We think about that um, across um, not just geographic borders, but ethnic borders of religious borders, et, um, et cetera. That if we could be as finely tuned to the pitch of someone else's cultural practice as we are to you know, music or lyrics, you know, that's how we become a more culturally um, literate uh, society. Um, in terms of radical self-love, um, you know, these uh, many of us have experienced pain, or are experiencing pain, or are experiencing trauma, and um, there are um, cycles that we perpetuate as a result of that pain, as a result of that trauma. Um, self-love is hard to practice um, when there are inputs from everywhere suggesting that you are not enough. So 
Um, one of the things about this moment of isolation is that we have to be enough for ourselves that whatever demons that we're confronting, whatever um, kind of objects of discomfort are in our midst, we're having to develop the muscle that enables us to um, be self-sustaining and self-stable. Many of us, I think, are either bored out of our minds with ourselves or are falling a little deeper in love with ourselves because we literally all we got. So how do we carry that into public space, into the public domain? And again, um, whose role is it to nurture that self-love in practice? Um, this is why I think arts organizations and cultural organizations are so important because when I go, um, you know, invariably when I go back to watch, you know, soccer games at the bar, like those are not places of radical self-love. Like it's me in Barcelona and, you know, like, you know, if you're a Madrid fan and we got issues, that's not the place. But art spaces, art spaces are the place where um, I think our humanity is nurtured in a, in a different kind of way. So, so moving this, transposing what we've had to practice as we've been in isolation and finding spaces that continue to nurture that impulse. Um, that's really what our role is moving forward, I think. That's great. Yeah, I, I feel that once all of this is over and we go back to, you know, a, a work culture that we're all more familiar with, a lot of people are going to be a lot more self-aware and mm -hmm. hopefully that practice of self-love that everyone is hopefully doing now will translate really well into what we're doing in our communities. Um, and we have one last question from Malik, um, who's a first year of the program. Hey, Malik. Hey. Um, what advice or some gems uh, would you give young Vimuti just finishing undergrad or graduate school? <laughs> uh, oh, and would he listen? <laughs> uh, okay. Would he listen? Yeah, you know what? He would listen. He would listen because uh, his elders were tight and he um, now. He'd listen, would he follow through? I don't know. But he would definitely listen, he would definitely take it in. He would probably mess up a little bit, but he would listen. Um, in terms of the gems themselves, or, you know, we, I um, came out of undergrad. Um, I, I've just, I've always been an artist. I When I came out of undergrad, I, I taught at a, um, at a high school um, north of the uh, the Golden Gate Bridge in, in Marin County for um, a couple of years. Before that first year was out, um, I'd found my artistic community and we were all hustling. You know, we were all hustling together. We were um, finding any way we could to make rent, um, to make our lives which meant you had, you know, 19 jobs and they weren't all the same every day. And now I'm, um, you know, 40 something years old and I still got 19 jobs, hella hustling, just doing mad things every day. So, um, and that's because the goal was never to like have a dope job. The goal was always to contribute to a world that I want to live in, that our kids need, that fills me with inspiration and hope. You know, I, I, I try to connect to people that inspire me, that are um, bold and courageous, and to um, not follow their lead, but work with other leaders. Um, so I guess that's the main thing, man, is associate with people that are doper than you are, which is something that I'm still trying to do. And, um, you know, do not be defined by your job, be defined by your mission. 
and where it's possible, shape your um, shape the job of the folks around you according to a shared vision. Um, that's not always easy, but I think that ulti ultimately is what I do. Um, I make spaces of common purpose. I make diverse spaces of common purpose and um, somehow have found a way to make a living out of all that. So, yeah. Listen up, young Bamuti. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so, so much. That was um, the end of our question portion. Um, Anya, would you like to say anything to close out? Thank you so much, Bamuti. Yeah, thank you, Bamuti, for such an engaging discussion. Can we all give him one more round of socially distant applause? Yay! Um, and thank you all so much for your participation. Um, we're grateful that you've set aside this time today. And thank you to Americans for the Arts for their support. Um, I also um, want to make the announcement that we've decided to postpone the virtual happy hour um, until we can find a way to make it more of a safe space. So we will not be doing that. Um, and before you leave, if you have a minute, we just have a short survey if anyone would be willing to fill that out before they leave. I'm gonna put it in the chat. Um, but that is all that we have. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thanks, squad. Peace.